Good morning everyone, welcome back to my channel. So this morning I think I might stitch the little birdhouse. Let's get that into position and then I can focus on um, the flowers. But everything's stitched down so I spent a bit of time whizzing around the outside of all of these little pieces of floral plus the embroidery piece. So now I just want to get this little birdhouse in but what are we going to stitch him in I mean color and also what material so do we use cotton or do we use the wool there's nothing jumping out at me there I'm tempted to do it in the red but I'm thinking the red might ab absorb it because it's got red flowers everywhere so I'm thinking I might need to do something a little bit don't mind that color it's a bit of a dirty green color is that pretty not really once again might be absorbed a bit I think they're good colors for the actual flowers and things. What else have we got in here? Pinks and there's a blue but we don't have blue. It's a real challenge when you've got um, a very limited colour palette. How about this? Uh, see that's not going to be seen. It's one of those colours that by itself it looks great but when you put it on to a creamy background like the linen it just disappears i could go a bit brighter once again i think it'll disappear i think maybe it needs to be actually um see down here we've got the beehive and the water feature i think it needs to be a combination of those colors so it sort of all connects i know that's boring it is a little boring but i think it actually would look rather good i think it'd bring all of the pieces together does that make sense so that's what we're going to do and what we might do is use a darker brown over i'm not even finishing my sentences you must be sitting there going what are you trying to say girl use your big words i wonder if there's enough on that i think i'm going to use those two well i went down a rabbit hole last night I don't know how it happened. I just, I don't know how these things happen. It's Mr. YouTube. He sends me things that I might like to watch. And of course I do. So suddenly there's three, four hours of my life gone. So I got to tell you all about it. I even took notes. I'm thinking, oh, look at this. Look at that. Everyone's going to want to see this. Shocking. The other thing that come across my um phone was i'll start with that first because i'll pop that in the description as well um house and garden a publication focusing on um, i guess a certain style of house and garden a real classic style they have done a story on the family that owns the tassel uh, shop that i went to in paris all about making tassels I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I'm thinking, I know, I know that place. So I on sent it to Lara and Lisa. And um, yeah, it was really lovely to relive that experience. So very exciting. Now I need to turn this work a little bit and get myself into position. So I'm thinking I'm going to couch couch it all down because I like that sort of look it sort of gives it a bit of a 
a rustic rustic feel because of the little stitches going over the whole piece. So I'll pop the story for that down below the tassels so you can have a little look at that. It's it's beautiful photos in there, absolutely beautiful. And there's also photos of inside their factory. We only saw the showroom in Paris, but their factory was outside of town. And um, that's where they have the bulk of the looms. We just saw the one working. So yeah, it was just interesting to see a little bit more than what we did see. That makes sense. What's going on here? Not so soon, please. There we go. So my rabbit hole. Now, there'll be a lot of Aussie girls listening that will know this. I didn't. I don't know. It's probably because I'm a Queenslander because this really is a Ballarat story. Now, up on YouTube popped a lecture from a gentleman who's one of the curators at the um, Eureka Centre in Ballarat, which is a big museum that um, celebrates the history and the stories of the Ballarat region. Now, Ballarat for Australia is a very big gold mining district. I'd have to say without knowing for sure that it would be our biggest gold mining district. And a lot of history came out of that area. Some uh, famous battles, as in uh, the Eureka flag is connected to a civil unrest. So up pops this lecture from the uh, Wool Museum based within the Eureka um, Centre. And this gentleman is the curator of um, the quilt section. So that piqued my attention, as you can imagine. And it was all about the Wagger quilt. Now, they're not 100% sure where they came from, but the word Wagger is very loosely connected to a town in the next state of New South Wales called Wagga Wagga. So they believe that it is somehow connected to that region. And between all of these regions of New South Wales and Victoria, there were a lot of people traveling, moving around, uh, shearing sheep, looking for gold. It was quite a transitional time in our history where there were just, yeah, people on the road all the time. So out of necessity, these men would often create themselves some warm blankets but they were quilts as in materials stitched together layers one uh, two to three layers of fabrics now the fabrics that they had access to were um, flower bags jute and hessian bags to do with the wool industry so it was just whatever they could get their hands on and they were stitched together to create some warmth because it is a pretty cold region through those areas. So this museum has been on the lookout for these waggers, these quilts, and they've got quite a beautiful collection of them. Now it's supposed to be one of the biggest collections in the world of quilts made from that period of time. So I was just like absolutely enthralled. And the gentleman speaking, I can't remember his name now. I should have written that down. I'll have a link to his lecture. It goes for about just under an hour. And he just talks through the stories behind these quilts, how they've got their collection together and some uh, learnings from the whole um, preservation of this piece of history. So... The very early ones are made of hessian bags and um, a little bit of calico. Not a lot, but a little bit. But then flour started coming out um, in these bags or um, different grains and mazes. So those bags are, are seen through these quilts as well. Then if, if the quilt was for 
a man that was traveling through the region, maybe shearing sheep, his would be of those types of materials. Now, if the wagger was within a family, the lady of the house would incorporate whatever she could find and it would be reusing some clothing, some fabrics, some clothes, and they started printing um, like you would know the corn sacks of the United States. They started printing designs on our flower sacks. So the ladies of the house where they could would um, incorporate these printed pieces of fabric within the quilts. So there's been, I think in 2019, they did a national search for anyone who had a wagger tucked away in the cupboard. Now, a lot of them have long gone. I like his saying, he said, they've either ended up in dog beds or rabbit hutches as warmth for animals, because you can imagine what they look like. They're just scraps of bits and pieces stitched together to create some form of warmth for whoever was owning the actual quilt. So they're not the prettiest of things. Anyway, in the process of looking for the, all of these waggers, they came up in that one year with 10 of them. So it was quite a find. And they've now dedicated a section of the Wool Museum to the wagger. And also every year they add contemporary, more modern uh, quilts to the museum as well. So reading between the lines, because he didn't really go into that side of it, and you may be able to correct me, the local ladies, it sounds like there's a bit of a, a search for new quilts every year to join the um, collection. I just need to stop for a minute, concentrate here. My bird house roof is a bit skew if. Am I having a little ledge or am I not? I don't think I am. So if you're one of the lucky ones, your quilt might be included forever in the museum as part of our, our history of quilting in this country. So oh, it was just so interesting. Now I think I've given you a basic overview of what it was all about. I'll just refer to my notes. Um, okay, yeah, that's pretty much, it's all part of the Eureka Centre, which celebrates the Ballarat region and its history, predominantly gold, but then came with it the movement of people, the depression in the 1930s, the lack of basic necessities, so making a quilt for warmth was out of materials that they could source. He did mention the first needle ever found in the world was in Australia, which I didn't know, 60,000 years ago. And there's also the first um, recorded textiles created uh, in Egypt, so which goes back even further. So I'm guessing if the needles had to survive, they would have been there too. But there is an actual needle that they've found. Um, the native Australians were stitching together um, textiles and different, um, what would you, how would you say it, like fibres to create clothing and warmth and they have a possum cloak down there. It looks amazing. So that's the very first Australian examples of, of stitching together layers of, um, oh, not fabrics, but, you know, textiles to create something. And then along came post-colonial history. So Australia is settled and the Europeans are traipsing around the place. Of course, they're cold and out of necessity, these men who are trying to sort of get out there and get some work um, create the wagger. So oh, it was just so interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I will put in the link below the lecture. Now I've got a hang of a mess. The lecture. So you can have a little listen to what he says. He, um, I'll also put in a link to the museum because I went then further down the rabbit hole and I found that I could actually walk through the museum at that section where all the quilts are virtually and it was fantastic. So I'd highly recommend it. Follow the link and there'll be all these little dots on the carpet step on the dots with your mouse on your computer or you touch your screen with your finger that'll take you to that spot 
and then just when you look up you'll see a dot on the wall if you click on that up pops a piece of information and also an up close photo of the quilt that's hanging right in front of you so they've got some amazing examples there's a, a baby's cot quilt there it's just adorable and it's just bits of clothing stitched together to make this this quilt for a little cot absolutely beautiful and they've all got stories too so the families are often still connected to the region or at least nearby um, well not nearby but able to tell the story of how that quilt was part of their family and their memories which is just beautiful so something for you to explore listen to a lecture about the wagga quilt if you're so inclined and then go to the museum and have a look at some of them it's really incredible the um it, there's a few here in brisbane too apparently i'm yet to track them down but he mentioned the powerhouse museum now i think that's here in brisbane but i might be wrong it's been a little while since i've been in the museum circuits need to get back out there i think there's um some history to be discovered i believe especially in the textile industry there's some new exhibits so yeah something a bit different it was a rabbit hole that I didn't expect to fall down, but, oh, gee, it was lovely. He, um, the gentleman doing the quilt talk, I think his name was Stephen. How rude of me, I didn't even get his name. See, that's typical. I see the fabric and I'm just tunnel visioned. He has a background in the industry as in um, he spent four years in Texas as part of a museum there so and he was heavily immersed in some quilting groups that are in texas apparently if there's anyone from texas you guys have a a very rich quilt history and he does talk a little bit about that experience and what he learned uh, and now he's back to australia as he is australian and he's part of this particular um particular demonstration oh, well show museum curation so very interesting gentleman he was he's a unusual to listen to he's sort of I think he's got the flu actually because he's sort of his throat gets dry and you can see he's trying to search for some water and then his nose I think there's a sneeze and then you can just hear his nose starts dribbling it's like the poor fellow he's so into what he does you can just see he's He's very, very much immersed in the industry of quilting and the hist well, the history of quilting. But he's got the flu and it's coming up fast on him, the, the, the symptoms of the flu, poor fellow. What else did I write down that I wanted to tell you? I think that's about it. He was talking about what's the recipe of a wagger. Well, if it was a bushman, it'd be jute, burlap, burlap and a little bit of calico but mainly mainly the the materials you'd find in a wool shed or on the side of the road maybe a, a pumpkin a potato farmer or something like that those bags and if if he was lucky some calico and then the jute and the hessian would be the internals and the calico would be the outside but we're not talking meters of calico we're talking a a bag that would be a third of the size of this quilt I'm working on. He'd open it up to get that fabric a little bit bigger and then um, stitch it on top of his collection of Hessian and jute. And then if a lady was involved in a wagger, you can imagine, we can't help ourselves, can we girls? There would be some form of decorative fabric in there whether it was something from a dress or a jacket so often they had a little bit of velvet um, some florals you know whatever the girls could get maybe some old curtains were worked into it out of necessity and whatever they could get their hands on so yeah it's very very interesting 
I'm going to have to go searching for some more historical stories that you just YouTube. It's brilliant when these museums pop some of their lecturers up on YouTube so we can get to listen. It must have been something that happens quite regularly within the museum or it was a special event. I'm not really sure because he starts off and says, how many quilters in the room? Pretty much the whole room puts their hands up. So whether it's just a general day in their uh, lectures or it was an actual event, hence why he had so many quilters in the room. So I uh, definitely got it on my to-do list. I have friends down in Geelong. And then, of course, my mate, Susanna, who's from the region. I need to go and see those quilts, Susanna. It was so good to be able to walk virtually around the museum, but, you know, to be there in person and actually see the textiles would be just a little bit special. Gee, that's a crooked wall on this birdhouse. We've got a wonky, wonky birdhouse. That's okay. Just don't have enough thread to get down to the bottom there. So what rabbit hole have you fallen down lately that is a historical rabbit hole? I've been so uh, immersed in French history and I swear everything I'm watching on TV lately seems to have a French influence. Like it's quite amazing how often Paris has popped up just in general movies I don't know if it's because Mr Google's watching and he knows what I'm thinking <laughs> probably but just random movies and they can be war movies and suddenly here's uh, Montmartre here's the Eiffel Tower it's I'm sure it's always been there around me but it's because I've been there that it's you know top of mind but now these wagger quilts have popped up. I might try and grab my phone and show you some of the quilts. I'll just finish this little bit of the birdhouse. Come down this leg here and just secure these posts. There we go. I was so hoping that I'd have time um, within the week. I'm going down to Melbourne to visit, um, uh, not visit, I do a course in um, with Lisa Maddock out at um, the Mornington Peninsula. It's, I think it's Rose Bay is the area. There's a, I'm just going to use this thread. No, I'm not. I'm going to take that out. I think I need more of a colour difference there to do a four-day course with Lisa and I was hoping when I booked my flights I in my mind I had plenty of time before or after I wasn't quite sure to go and do a bit of retail therapy in the region and then after hanging out with uh, Susanna in um, Paris from Vintage Blend Studios YouTube channel uh we were starting to cook up plans of, you know, catching up and she was going to show me the region and she'd offered me a bed and I was like, yes, that'll work, that'll be great. And then when I got home and finally said to myself, okay, start thinking about the next adventure, which was this, this um, course, I realised that my flights are very tight. I'm in and I'm out. So I didn't have that time I thought I did. I booked it nearly 12 months ago. So if I had have thought more, I would have made, you know, stayed an extra couple of days. And because Susanna's in that Ballarat region, I could have gone to the museum. Next time, this sounds like a lot I need to do in that region. So I think there'll be a special trip to come down have a good look at Ballarat, check out these museums. I'm going to, oh, I just can't get this started. 
I'm going to double that thread. It's very fine. I'm going to double it and then I'm going to couch it. So let's get that double knot done. Yeah, the, um, the gentleman was really interesting. It sounds like he learnt a lot when he did his four-year tenure in um, Texas. The different quilts from the region there in history. That's really interesting. Use that paler color and just get this little door. It's trickier doing a curve, but couching is just the best way to get a curve. You can really get your shape right. You watch as I do it. I won't be able to get the shape right. That's it. Concentrating. Okay. Nearly there. Now I'm on. Oh, now I've done threads, but it's all right. Pretty much got my door stitched. Yeah, that's good. Happy with that. Now, get the little bit of law and order back here. That's it. Now, just to end this guy off. So yeah, if you can recommend any other lectures that you may have come across from museums, even if it's Egypt, like it's all, all very interesting. Let me know, because um, I'm feeling very historical at the moment. I'm enjoying the trip down through history. Okay, so what are we going to do now? We've got a little... I'm thinking I might satin stitch that in. Then it would look like a dark little opening. So I'll get a few stitches across the hole. That'll then get my shape. I don't know how circular it'll be. I think it'll be more like an oblong, but anyway, <laughs> doesn't matter. It was meant to be an oblong if it's an oblong. Don't mind doing a few separated stitches across a large area like that and then coming back and filling it in. Sort of helps you keep your shape a little bit better. Mind you, they're not straight, but it's 
So now I'll just jump out here and drop a little stitch in. And then come back a little bit, drop another stitch in and then fill it in. Here we've got an oblong. Right, one little hole for the little bird to get into his little cage. It's not a cage. It's a birdhouse. It's where he's sleeping and he can leave it any time he wants. Now that little heart, I'm tempted to use a piece of fabric there, you know, to get um, something decorative on there. What have I got that's handy? There's my box of tricks here. Is there a red fabric suitable? A lot of these are florals. Not really. Could do with a real solid red. They're all very florally. Oh, I know, I can see a bit of sari silk on my table up here. Let's see, ya. this has popped up around the place. Let's see if we can cut out a little heart as a decorative. Do the old fold it in half. The gift that keeps giving this little piece of sari silk. I think it's a bit. I don't know if this is going to work. I can feel it disintegrating in my fingers. It's too big for a start. Oh, it's fraying. Fraying bad. I keep mucking around with it. You never know. Yeah, that's got potential. Oh, don't fray, don't fray. I wonder if I can get a little bit of glue onto it before it disintegrates. And then once that's dried, I can put some Decorative stitching around it. Come on. Stay there. Do not fall apart. Oh, this might be a dumb idea. Oh, talk about going down rabbit holes. This is another example of that. Stay there. There we go. We gotcha. We gotcha. If I can just let that dry, it'll be just enough to tack it there so then I can come back through with needle and thread and secure it. There we go. All right, we'll just stay away from that little spot. Now, what's next? Sip of my coffee. I need a little doorknob. I just do a little knot. And what else could we do there? A little bird. OK, 
Come on, not up. So what do you guys all got planned for today? I don't have anything exciting. Nothing at all, to be honest. Just probably book work for the business. Nothing exciting. <clears throat> Do four wraps. I might even do a second video. I have a feeling that I'm going to get to the end of this hour and feel like doing more and just turn the camera back on. So that's, I think, what is going to happen. Come on, thread the needle. Unless I set myself a heap of homework to do at the end of this. But I think it's just not over enough. Oh, I'm going to have to take it off. I shouldn't fiddle, but I'm going to have to. That's better. That's better. Might, um, have I got a thread can go straight in there with to pin it down don't think I do I could use a contrast make a bit of a feature out of the heart by doing this pumpkin colored thread so the last prompt, I reckon I know what it is. I've been reading your comments and thinking about what would be down the end of the garden. And I'm going to take a bet, well, not a bet, but you know what I mean, that it is mushrooms. It just makes sense. So my theory is mushrooms. I don't know if it's mushrooms. But I have a feeling it could be mushrooms. This little heart is disintegrating. I don't think this is going to work. Oh no, that's just one thread. Get this stitch down before it does disintegrate. Yep, I reckon it's mushrooms. Makes sense, doesn't it? A few of you mentioned the, you know, the compost pile as well. And I thought, well, that sort of sounds about right. You could have a compost pile down at the end of the garden and then mushrooms would grow in the compost pile. So that's what I reckon it is. Which is a problem for this quilt because mushrooms are going to be behind the chair. I'm going to have mushrooms coming up here. So I might have to go looking for another little spot on the quilt somewhere where I could sneak a mushroom in. So I've got mushrooms on the other pieces already, at least two of them. But I do have a lot of work to do on the um, Splash of Colour quilt. So even if I can't get many mushrooms around the place, I've got plenty to do, and that'll bring the projects all to a nice close, which will be fantastic. I'm ready to start something new. I think there's going to be a lot more people join in in this particular project too. I'm noticing uh, comments come up on the Facebook group to say that we've been watching for some time all of the videos and the photos and this particular project they feel like they can you know join in on so that's going to be awesome I think this treasure hunt might just be one of the biggest ones yet it's a good one too because there's not a lot of um, creativity in the way of 
sketching something that's a prompt. You know, it's more of a collection of items stitched down and then just with a little bit of decorative stitching or whatever takes your fancy. You don't even have to do that. It's not like you have to sketch out something completely random like a chair or, you know, it can be quite challenging doing that type of embroidery. So I think it's going to be a big, I'm going to just trim that little hair off there. That's better. There we go. There's our little primitive heart stitched in. Don't come undone, goodness sakes. There we go. Now, okay. So, some little birds for our little bird house. Now, these ones down here, what did I do? Just some of the pink. I think I used that for there. It's good when it's already figured out. What did I do with my needle? Don't tell me I just lost the needle. Because then you can just hit repeat. So we will stitch in. So the little bird, all I did was some sideways stitches. I'll bring it up. So I just did starting real small, coming out into a bit of a body shape. Just little stitches like that. See, real simple. And then I put on a little beak of a different colour, a couple little tail feathers and a couple little legs. Kept it simple. Just a little Tweety Bird. Really easy. Let's get to up to this guy here. It's a bit of a black mess. That's what it is. Barely a bird there. Going to have to go off on my own. I might double that. Did I double it? Yeah, just to make it a bit quicker. Let's double that. Okay, let's try that again. We'll be here all day if I don't double up these little fine threads. Never get this piece finished. <laughs> All right, let's get little bird done. That's it. Tiny little stitch. A couple of those. I'm going to have to take my glasses off so I can see. There we go. And we have one little Tweety Bird. Now I'm tapering his body back down. I still have not decided on my mood boards. I just don't think I can yet. I think I've got to get these projects done, the fabrics from these projects back to their positions in my room and then pick again because I feel like I'd be, I'm going to be very similar anyway because these are my colours. It's what I tend to do. But 
I think if I got everything back to its location, there might be new pieces that will pop out to me. And I might inadvertently get a new mix. The other thing too is, um, I don't know if you all saw, I might link it below actually, Susanna is back from her Paris and UK trip. And she has bought way more fabrics than I did. And she's putting together some packs. So I guess too, what's holding me back from deciding on my color schemes, let alone what projects I'm gonna do, um, is what fabric Susanna brought back because I can, it's, I can buy some packs from her and add it to my packs because she's picked similar colors. So my French reds will very much be able to continue because I can already see that she's picked bits and pieces. She's actually picked up a few pieces of fabric that I had in my hand at one point, but um, decided against and she's come along and picked it up. So isn't it amazing? I, I just find that so incredible that, you know, we're very similar in our color taste. She's probably a little bit more pastel than I am, but look, we both dance through all the colors. Like at the end of the day, we just love color. So I'm sort of waiting on the fabric packs and I think once I get them, I'll know where I'm heading with it all. So at this stage, I have not even looked at a mood board. And I haven't even decided what blooming thing I'm going to make yet. I've got to be a little bit careful with my time too, this time. I was able to do four projects, no problems, plus, plus. But I think I'm going to have a very busy second half of the year. I can already see a lot coming my way. So I even had a little bit of a panic attack um, over the weekend as I was coming back from our visit up to Harvey Bay, just thinking about what's on my agenda this coming year not only with work but in the personal world and I just I don't know I have a feeling my dad's farm is going to sell I just I don't know we we saw a house too or not a house so much more of a we haven't even looked in the house farmers never look in the house do they we saw a property for sale that he could downsize to semi-retire to but it still has land for him to continue doing what he loves, which is growing vegetables, but less acreage instead of a big farm. And I don't know, it just seemed like things are aligning a little bit at the moment. I don't know, it's just funny how stuff like that happens. His place, his place is on the market. And I rang the agent just to touch base because we haven't really heard much for about eight months. And he has had an inquiry and the lady would get back to him in the next week, you know. She was just making sure it was for sale. And I said, it's funny you should mention that because we found a property that might be suitable. So I just wanted to call you and see, you know, what was all happening. So long story short, my head started going through everything I'd need to do to pack up a farm and move my dad and my brother to a new farm. Not to mention what we'd have to do at the new location to get it ready to become a farm. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. And of course, I'm in Brisbane and they're in the South Burnet, potentially moving to the Fraser Coast region. And just the logistics alone, I said to my husband, I'm going to have to probably go there a month and do this and that's just one of the tasks going on at the moment there's just a lot of work coming in my business as well there seems to be a bit of a flurry in the Christmas decorating industry so there's a few clients wanting to upgrade their clients Christmas displays so 
That's always a lot of fun because we get to make key pieces again. So you just have some of those years that it just goes crazy. And then the next year will be a lot quieter and not so bad. But I don't know, I might be overthinking it. And then I was thinking, my goodness, if I go and start seven projects with Roxy's stitchery. <laughs> oh my goodness. Having said that, this type of thing is my sanity. So the girl can't be stopping. She's got to have to have something. So I'm just not sure how many Roxy projects I'll start because I've also got things I want to do as well and oh my goodness me so you can see just talking about it I can feel I can feel my um not anxiety but you know what I mean I can feel my uh, am I going to have enough time to do all that feeling and the other thing going on which I haven't really mentioned to you guys is um we're building a house in the Fraser Coast area and we plan to move there now we had planned to go there this year but the year is sliding away fast because the builders taken forever it's close to two years it's been building so the, the plan is to pack up and move to that area so if that happens well it will we're going to get the keys to the place within a matter of months. And then if my dad's farm sells, and that has to be packed up, and my brother's house will then need to be sold, and his house will be packed up. Oh boy. I said to my husband, something's gonna have to give. We might just have to move ourselves next year in the off season. The off season for me is January, February, March, and April. We do the orders for our business, but the shops are really quiet and there's just not that busy trade. Because, yeah, in amongst it all, I still have two Christmas shops to run. And they're starting to get a little busy. Well, not so much foot traffic but the inquiries and the quoting we're doing for jobs is starting to come in. And and let's just add some more to the list. I'm having a real whinge here. You guys will be sitting there at home going, oh my God, girl, you're insane. The, the other thing that's happening very shortly, what do I'm doing for his feet? What did I do? It was like a chocolate, I think. Yeah, very fine chocolate. The other thing that's about to happen is within a week, our shipping containers of Christmas stock are going to start rolling in. I think the first one's due about the 14th. Your first two are due about the 14th of June. So somewhere within that week, two 40-foot containers of Christmas trees are going to land. So... They need to be unpacked and stowed and all of the Christmas trees that sold out last year need to be rebuilt and fluffed up and made look gorgeous. And in amongst that container is also a heap of foliage as in flowers, poncetias and all sorts of different magnolias and, you know, pretty things. And those things go on our Christmas trees to form part of the decorations. So we're pretty much going to be starting to get our stores ready. <clears throat> ready for the season of Christmas. So I might be worrying about nothing. <clears throat> I might be just overthinking it. None of it's confirmed. None of it's going to happen. And it'll all just cruise on nicely and all fall into place. That's what my husband says. He's very <clears throat> worry about when it happens type of fellow. And I may make a list. Oh, my God, what have I got in front of me? How am I going to get on top of all this? 
what can I divert, what can I change, nothing too bad, you just got to go with it. So yeah, welcome to my world guys, it's about to get hectic. So I just don't know how many Roxy projects I'll be doing. Not if I want to do a few other things as well, and I don't know. <sighs> You're feeling exhausted now. You're all sitting there going, oh, I'm buggered. <laughs> That's how I felt. We're driving back from um, Harvey Bay. We've been up to check the house. And the builder says, oh, I'll be putting carpet in at the end of the month. And I'm like, what? Carpet? What's that mean? And he's like, well, you'll be getting your house, your front door key. And I thought, oh, that's exciting. I haven't started hacking yet. And then in amongst it all, we had a look at a property for my dad and brother. And I guess it all downloaded into my head at what is ahead of me for the next six months yay that'll be all right it'll all work out always does now that i've debriefed with you guys i've vented i'm sure it'll all work out did i put an eye on this bird what did i do down here they got eyes no have they no no eyes all right they're too far away to have eyes. You can't see a bird's eye anyway. They're very small. So there we go. We've got two little birdies. Our little bird house is done. How are we going for time? There we go. So we've covered a lot of topics today. Like I said before, um, the link to the lecture will be below. The link to the museum, if you want to go for a virtual tour and have a look at these quilts, will be below. I did say I was going to show you a couple. I might just do that in the last few minutes because um, here, I'll just turn the volume down. Eyes of quilt. Let's get rid of the volume. So this is the gentleman giving the lecture. And if I run the thingamajigger through, you'll start to see some of the quilts. He's sort of talking a little bit about history there. That quilt there is an American quilt. Get to the end, there's one. Oh, now there's an ad. I won't put you through that torture. Okay, that's it there. So that's got a lot of velvet in it, and that's from 1930. Um, it's <laughs> very early collectors described it as the world's worst wagger. Today it's considered one of the most significant waggers in the National Wool Museum. So it's pinks and greens, and inside is um, um, jute bags. So that's the local flour mill where they believe a lot of these flour sacks came from. There's a picture of a traveling worker and he's got everything he owns on the back of his bike there. Now he would have had a wagger to keep himself warm made from all of these different materials. So let me just scoot through. There's a very old one. Now that one here is here in Brisbane in the Brisbane Valley Historical Society has this one and it's all calico, calico bags all stitched together. There's another, that's the, that's the child's cot. You can see different items of clothing. I think that there is a sleeve here. It looks like a sleeve to me, but it's all been opened up. There's a little little shoulder there of something go back to that you can see that looks like a neckline of a like maybe a little christening dress or something I, I don't know but that looks like a small piece of child's clothing let me go back further there's another one that one's got um uh, men's suits 
And then the, the family that donated this, it belonged to someone from 1953. They can remember this being on their, um, in their family and they remember the green jacket, they remember the floral, uh, the, the check dress, that piece of fabric there he talks about and it appears again up here that it was a skirt, I think it was, that the mother wore and she also wore. So this one was found in the back of a cupboard and is now in the museum. This is a contemporary piece that was made in 2019 and it's a salute to the wagger. So it's just that random piecing of fabrics to create the blanket. Uh, this, this is another contemporary one. This is all chicken feed calico bags. So the actual blanket was made in 1990 and it's now in the museum as a tribute to the calico bags. Like, you, oh, the rabbit hole, it's crazy. I started Googling chicken feed bags, flower bags. I found a heap of them that were reasonably priced, and I was like, oh, maybe I make a wagger. And then I'm like, I don't need a wagger. Oh, it's ridiculous. Put the wagger away, girl. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll leave you alone. The little birdhouse is complete. So I think I can't hear my hubby. He's not he's not up and about yet. I might um, turn the camera back on and start working on some of the floral, but the little birdhouse is at least done. All right. If I don't see you shortly, I will see you all in the next video. Bye for now.